So last time we introduced the um, control, the data section of the CPU and saw how the control signals could um, route the data in the uh, data section of the PEC9 CPU. And we did a little demo. I think we're I think we're done with the demos for a, a little bit. So I think, um, and what we, had, what we did, if you'll recall at the end of class last time, is we looked at how, at the von Neumann cycle. Remember that? And as it turns out, so let's take a look at this figure 12.4, is a picture of the, is a description of the von Neumann cycle at this level of abstraction. And what we did is we did we saw how to fetch the instruction specifier at the address that's in the PC, but we didn't do PC gets PC plus one. And that's part of the von Neumann cycle. And we so at, we did that. That's what we did at the end of class last time. So let's real quickly see if we can go through and um, finish that out. All right. Now. So here is a little recap of figure 12.2. Uh, and now let's see if we can do the control signals for adding one to the program counter. All right? Now, how in the heck are we going to do that? Because the buses, the A bus and the B bus, are both just eight bits. It's one byte. But we know that the program counter is two bytes. So do we add the high order first or the low order first? Low order. We add, yeah, we add the low order. And then what we have to do is we have to store the, the carry bit in the, we have to store the carry in the, in which bit? Are we going to store it in the S bit, the shadow carry, or are we going to store it in the C bit, the carry bit? Yeah, the shadow carry. Because we don't want the user at level ISA 3 to see any possible change in the carry bit because the adding one to the program counter is for the person that the programmer at level ISA 3 is invisible. Are you with me? All right, so let's go around. Let's go around the room. Um, so what do we have to put on? So how do we do this? Who wants to go first? We'll, uh, we'll, okay. So, and, I forget which uh, cycle this is going to be. Let's just number it one for now. It won't be one when we finish. But in the first, so what's the very first thing we? So by looking at this figure, you want to start? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. A, okay. So and what about A? Um, what do we have to set A to? to one, right? Are you clear? Claiming A equals one. Now let's look at that because. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, uh, no, okay. You're right about the A. It has to be equal seven. What? A what? Seven. Yes, yeah, seven. Okay. Now, why do you say seven? The, uh, the program, the PC, the program counter. The program counter. Yeah. Let's look at the program counter. The program counter is at what register addresses? Six and seven. Six and seven, mm -hmm. and the seven is the low order byte of the program counter. So that's right. So A equals 7. All right, next. <laughs> you can pass if you want. Uh, I'll pass. You'll pass. So do you want to, you, you know what, uh, what do we put on B and the B bus? B equals 6. Close but no cigar. Oh, oh, no, no. Oh, no, you got it, you got it now? No. You were adding one, exactly. So 23. Ha, I got it. So B equal, and why is it 23? Because that's, 20, where the one is that's where the one is. The 23, is it, you see that on the figure? So 23 is where the one, the constant one is stored. And now we got those, on, so now we're accessing, we have A and B set. So now we've got this info on the A bus and the B bus. So now what, is it, what, is, what do we have to do, where does it have to go through next? What do you think? What's next? Uh, now we got to send them to the uh, ALU. You. So how are we going to get that A through to the ALU? <coughs> do, do we just uh, do, do we clock it now? No, no. Well, I mean, uh, we're going to clock it eventually, but 
look, if, visualize it. Oh, maybe we should do the demo again. <laughs> visualize it. That, that we, we, we've, at, we've got A. We've got something on the A bus. We've got something on the B bus. But uh, we've got something on the A bus, but how do we get it to the ALU? What does it have to go through? So it, you know, it needs to go through the AMUX. It needs to go through the AMUX, is right. Set it to 1 because it's the end of the Good. Okay, so AMUX equals 1. All right, because, and because that will select it to go through. So now they are both presented to the inputs to the ALU. Now, do you remember what the ALU? Well, you'd have to, you'd have to look up the table. I think it's A plus B. Yeah, we need to select the A plus B function of the ALU. I'm, I, I think you're right. And so you, it's one, maybe, so comma, ALU equals one. Okay, so that, that's gonna add it. Now what? Needs to go through the CMUX. Needs to go through the CMUX. To go back up, right? To go back up, yeah. And so the CMUX, we want to send it through the which, the right or the left? Uh, the right, so the CMUX equals one. Okay, so um, I'll just continue this here. So CMUX equals one, okay. And by the way, along, well, okay, CMUX equals one. And now what? So now it's being presented to the register bank. So what's next? Yes, because as program counter gets program counter, and which part of the program counter, obviously? Uh, with the address seven. Yes, so that would be C equals seven, right? Now, what needs to get clocked where? Not because the, the comma separator is the what? what, is, what, is, what why do we have commas here? That's the concurrent. concurrent. So all of this is happening. The, these signals are set and, yeah. and it's being presented. Okay. And now, after, at, at the end of the cycle, what do we want to, which sequential circuits do we want to have receive, get informa information clocked into them? What do you think? Oh, my turn. Um, <laughs> aren't we just doing the load CK? Yes. So the information can go into uh, 7? Yes, that will clock it into that, yes. Because the C bus is what, okay. And But there's another one. Oh. Can you oh. tell by looking at the, oh, 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 shh, shh. it's not your turn. <laughs> you, you, were, you, you, you got your turn. <laughs> 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 No, that's all right. Or I'll pretend like I didn't hear it. Is it the shadow carry? Yeah, because, right, because the, the, the carry out from the ALU, the, output, there's, the C out will be, will be uh, presented, and it's, it's, be, it's being presented to both to the S shadow carry and to the regular C bit. But we only want to clock it into the which? Into the, into the shadow carry, right. So therefore, what do we have to put? So what control signal does that? Uh, that'll be um, uh, SCK. SCK. So we'll put a comma here and SCK. Good. Does everybody understand the mechanism, all the mechanisms here? See, this is just plumbing. Okay, so now, what's, so now at that point that the low order will be there. So now what do we want to do? Yes, we want to add z. Yes, we want to add zero to the high order, but we we need to do the add with the carry. Yeah. Okay. So now, so let's start off. So now, so what do we have to do here? So this time it's a equals six, and why six? Because that is the address of the high order byte of the accumulator, and then what? And then. And, uh, well, 23, what's at 23? Oh, 22, I'm sorry. We're at zero. Yeah, I think we want to add zero, so uh, at zero bytes, so 22. So this would be B equals 22. And then what? Do we need to, do we still need to, like, go down? 
Yeah, yeah. So A max, say it again. So A max equals one. One. A max equals one because it goes to the right. Okay. So A max equals one. And now what? Oh, we would have to look it up. Huh? No, I think one of the functions, can somebody look that up? Can you look, we need to know what the function is. What, what function do we need in the ALU? Um, so 2 is A plus B plus C. I think that's and yeah, it's 2? Okay, so, then, so that's ALU equals 2 because that function is the A plus B plus CN function. Exactly. Cmux equals one. Next. Uh, we have to say um, Cs mux. Oh, actually, you're right. What about the C? We have to set it as uh, zero one. Yeah, we the, the Cs mux has to be set also because it's gonna the, this ALU is gonna take the Cn. And so we need to route that from the S. So the CS mux, what did you say CS mux? Uh, I guess one. CS mux equals one. Oh, good call. That's for the shadow bit. Yeah, look, can you see on the figure that the CS mux controls the, whether the output of the CS mux is from the left, from the C bit, or from the right, from the S bit. And we saved the S bit in the previous cycle, and that's what we need to have to be the carry. Yeah, this is pretty. Yeah, this is pretty good, huh? I mean, everybody can we can understand how muxes multiplexers work and okay. See, it, okay, now what's next? I forget who's next. Um, C equals six. C equals six, and what kind of clocks? So it would be. Uh, um. And in the picture there, what yeah. after now that we've yeah. There's the load CK, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure what else you would do after that. Well, I think that's it. That's it. Oh. Well, uh, now now let's make sure we understand. When if load CK. If we specify that, that the load CK is the clock pulse, that's going to, that means that whatever is on the C bus is going to be clocked into the register bank at whatever address we put on with C. And that's what we want. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, so now you see how, the load, how that works. Okay. So this, and then we'd do load CK. And I don't think we, we need to store any carries on the way here because we've already taken it. Is everybody clear? All right, well, let's see if we did it right. Let's take a look at the next slide. Okay, this is figure 12.5. And so did we do it? Do check this with, uh, with what we have on the board. Uh, oh, do we, have a di do we have a difference? We have the shadow. Yeah. Oh, did we miss something? Oh. Yeah, you have the shadow before the load. Oh, oh, that's, okay, yeah, let's pause there for a second. Yeah, now you understand that all of these things that are separated by commas, yeah. they, this yeah. means, what is the comma separator? Yeah. It's concurrent. concurrent. Doesn't matter which, how, what order you list them in. Yeah. So that, that part's fine. Anything else? Other than that, are we good? Okay, yeah. Does everybody see how that works? And now, now you see, and you see these, uh, so this turned out to be not cycle one and two, but what? Like six and seven. Okay. Well, what are the cycles before? Fetch, and this is increment. So that was the fetch. We did that one yesterday. In fact, let's re review how that worked. You, you see how it did, you remember the A equals 6, B equals 7, MAR clock? What did that do? Here, let's go back. Let's review that. What did that do? 
that put what where? Yes, and where did it take it from? Here, let's, here's the code. It took, it took A equals 6 and B equals 7. So let's go to the figure. So what's, what's at A, 6, and 7? The program counter. Now why did it put the program counter into the memory address register? Do you remember how that worked? What does the program counter contain? No, 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 that's not what the program counter contains. What does the program counter contain? The what of the what? The address of the instruction to fetch. So do you see why we have to put the program counter into the MAR? Because the MAR is the address register and that's what goes to the address lines in, in main memory. Now this is super important. Do you see why that is? Do you see why we put that in there? Because the program counter contains the address of the instruction to fetch. And so we put the program counter into the memory address register because the memory address register is what is connected to those address lines on the main bus that then are feed into the chip so that we can get that into the memory chip, the main memory chip. So that, are you with me on that? So that's, okay, so that's the, that's the A equals 6, B equals 7, B equals 7, MAR clock. And then we said, once you do that, you got to assert memory how many times? How many times do we have to have me the memory signal? Three times. Three, times three, three, three consecutive cycles. At the end of the third cycle, what is present on the data bus? on the data lines of the system bus. The, the data from main memory at that address location. It takes three cycles in order to, to all propagate onto the bus. Are you with me? And then on cycle four, what, did, what do we have? We do MDR mux equals zero. Now what did that do? Let's go back here. MDR mux equals zero takes the data from where? from the system bus and presents it to the what? What's the MDR stand for? Memory data. Memory data register. And so at the end of that cycle, what do we have to do? Clock that in there. Okay, so, so that was the, so that was the um, MDR mux equals zero, semicolon, and MDR clock. And now that it's in the memory data register, but we're, we're fetching it. Now where do we put it? Let's go back to our figure. Where do we put it? We're fetching it into what? Right? What? <laughs> I think we said this yesterday. <laughs> what, what, <laughs> which register in the CPU stores the instruction? It must be the? Instruction. <laughs> okay. And furthermore, well, what's the address of the instruction register? 8, 9, and 10. So which part are we getting here? It should be 8 or 9 or 10. What do you think? What is it? What does it say here on the code? 1 or 3? It's 8. You remember? Because this is the instruction specifier. If it's a non-unary instruction, then we're going to have to do the second one and the third one. But this is the first one. In fact, I think that's your homework problem. I think you have a homework exercise for next time to actually do the another, another part of this. So do you see then on cycle number five, what we do is A mux equals zero. Now why do we do A mux equals zero? Oops. Why do we do A mux equals zero? from the MDR, and then it has to go through the ALU, so what function do we pick for the ALU? ALU zero. zero. I think zero sends A straight through. And then what do we have to do? Cmux equals one. Okay, yeah, well, this is getting good. Okay, and then we present it, and what do we put, where do we put it? Where do we say we were putting it? In the, in the instruction 
instruction array, which is eight, address eight. So does everybody understand all of this now? This is, and, and if we go back to our pseudocode description of the, of the um, figure, this figure 12.4, what we've done is we've done fetch the instruction specifier at the address in PC, and we've done PC gets PC plus one. All right, and then we would decode, and then if the instruction is not unary, then we have to do this and this and so on. All right, is everybody clear? Now, this next figure is a timing diagram. It's figure 12.6. This is a timing, and you know, you guys in the, in, we've, we're starting to do timing diagrams in the lab now, right? So you can see how this works. So what I've shown here is, in figure 12.6, is the values of the load clock line and the memory address register clock line and the memory data register clock line and the memory read line. And um, this, and there are one, two, three, four, five. This figure shows five cycles, right? It doesn't show six and seven. It shows those original ones. So do you see that on the first cycle, it was A equals six, B equals seven, MAR clock. And what did we say that did? Put the where, where? Program counter into the? Memory address register, MAR, right? And no, you see that when you do MARCK, that clock pulse is at the end of the cycle. So that's, you see how that, so you always, after the semicolon, that's where you, where you put the clock, the clock specification. You see how that works? And then what happens is, we assert mem read for three cycles in a row, a cycle two, cycle three, and cycle four. And at the end of cycle four, we do MDR mux equals zero and MDR clock. And so that clocks that in, right? And then we do A mux equals zero, ALU equals zero, C mux equals one, C equals eight, load clock, and then at the end of cycle five. And so this is typically how these uh, microcode programs work. Now, actually, now look. This, if you come back here to figure 12.5, what does this look like? This looks like a what? I mean, boom, 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 boom. What does this look like? Program. It looks like a program. It is a program. It's a hardware program. You see what I mean? So this is the language at level MIC2. This is a microprogram. So are you with me? So, you know, this is the language at level MIC2. It's the microprogram. It's the control seek. The, the pro, a, a program at level MIC2 is a sequence of control signals. And you can write it out like this, like you can just in a regular programming language. But basically what it's doing is it's controlling these hardware signals. So you see what you're do you see what we're doing? We're actually programming the hardware to do to do the data flow, to do the 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 information flow in the data section of the central processing unit. Yeah. Uh, how come it's not a stupid question, but how come memory takes its own like cycle for two and three and then it shares one with the MDR mux and the clock pulls Yeah, that's a good question. So so, um, here, let's go back. To the, the question is, how, why does this memory signal, why is, why is it asserted th during cycles two, three, and four, and then in cycle four it shares some stuff with yeah, why some... Why does it dedicate that cycle to memory? Yeah, okay, that's a good question. Let's, let's look at the... Did you have another question or did you... Okay, here, let's, let's, let's go back and look at... The, at, at the um, control signals in figure 12.2. You see that mem read line is the one at the very bottom of the figure? That is not a clock pulse, that is a control signal that tells memory, actually what that is connected to on the memory chip is the output enable. 
remember, remember those three, remember the three signals that control the memory chip? What were they? Well, what, what was the first one? The chip what? Remember the three? When we wired, when we wired the memory things and onto the bus? Chip, yeah, chip select. Chip select. Ch CS, remember chip select? And then what? Re it was, they were, the other ones were enables. Chip select, read, write enable, and read enable. Chip select, read enable, and write enable. Okay? And so that this, this mem read line goes over the bus and into the, oh sorry, it was, we called it output enable. It was OE. Write enable, that's for writing to memory. Yeah, it's a little confusing, isn't it? Because what happens is the input, input to the chip is output to the CPU. Yeah, so it's a little, you gotta, you gotta keep the, yeah. but the terminology, the OE and the W, the, out, the output enable and the write enable, that's standard terminology in the, for chip, chips, you know, memory chips. So we want to keep the standard terminology anyway. All right, now let's long-winded answer to your question. So, so what happens is it takes time. The memory subsystem needs three cycles before three cycles with the address asserted. It needs three cycles in order for all that propagation delay, you know, when we looked at how those memory chips are organized, all that propagation delay to come through and go through the system bus and be presented. Then at the end of this third cycle, we know that the data is on the memory bus, is on the system bus, the, the data lines of the system bus. So at the end of the third cycle, we can clock it into the MDR. Because see, look, if, if you look at the timing here in figure 12.6, you see at the end of cycle four, the re memory read has been asserted for three cycles in a row and the address has been in the MAR. The ad when did the address get put into the MAR? At the end of cycle what? At the end of cycle one. Of cycle one. So you see, so, so you put the ad, uh, you see how that works? You put the ad, and then, and then at the end of cycle, f at the end of the third cycle, which is cycle four, at the end of the third cycle of having the address asserted, that's what we know then that the data is, we could wait another cycle if we wanted to, but with the address asserted, but it'll be there. We guarantee that it'll be there after three cycles. Yeah, these are really good questions. It's really important that we get this, that these, all these questions answered because you have to have a, an, a, a model. I mean, you have to have a, a, a good uh, model of how all these parts of the circuit work. And, and a really important thing to understand here is the difference between a combinational circuit and a sequential circuit. But we've done that, right? You know, what's the definition of a combinational circuit? Ah, <laughs> what's the definition of a combinational circuit? The, the what? Only on the, the output depends only on the input. It only takes a few what in order for it to come to the output. A only a few gate delays. There's no state. But the registers have state. Did you have a question? I was going to say um, on that other slide where it lists out the um, the hardware code. This one? Yeah. And Figure 12.5. The, the line that Austin was asking, number four. So you said you could put it on an additional line, right? And then it would be another cycle. But you wouldn't want it to do that. that the last you, two. Okay. If you, if, you, if you put it on for four consecutive cycles, on the fourth cycle, you would still have to have memoried. Uh -huh asserted. Oh, okay. Because look, that MDR clock happens at the end of the cycle. Oh, I see. So. Do you see what I'm saying? You, 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 there's no way around having memoried and, and MDR CK on the same way. You've got to have it because that happens at the end of the cycle during which the address has to be asserted. Okay. Oh, these are really good questions. This is really good to get all, this, all these details down. So where are the like What do you mean the other memories? Because you do, like for two, you do like a memory to the address. Let's, uh, hmm? cycle two yep. and cycle three. Yep. What, and what about, that is, is all we're saying is that, 
that memory read line has to be asserted high three cycles in a row with the address on the address bus. But the address got clocked into the MAR on cycle one, so it's still there. So we have to see, we have to know that it's still there. You can't be changing the MAR during those three cycles. That would mess things up. Because, and, and that is a specification of the memory system. The memory system says, that, that's a spec. It says you got to have the ad, you got to assert the address and have memory three consecutive times, three, three consecutive cycles. At the end of the third cycle, the data will be on the data bus. That's the contract that the memory system fulfills with the system. It is a precondition for having it work right. These are really good questions. All right, now you guys comes another big concept. Look, how long does it take? How many cycles do we have to do, to do that memory? Three. And during that whole time, what has to happen? What has to be true? During those three, during those three times that the memory cycle is high, what has to be true? What do we have to do at the beginning? Seven. Yeah, the, yes, the address has to be in the MAR. But look, check this out, sports fans. As long as the address is still in the MAR and the memory read is high, we could be doing what? We could be using what? We could be using the other parts. Look, let's look at. Look, as long as, as long as we clock the stuff in the MAR, right, and the mem read is high for three cycles, what's being unused during those three cycles? ALU. The ALU and the what? A bus and the what? B bus and the what? C bus and the what? CS mux and the C mux and the blah, 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 blah. So, Now they have to take care of it. Well, no, no, no. I'm saying, I'm saying, I, we got, we, since see, we're since we're not using them, we can start using them. And yes, and how do you think we could, yeah, what do you, so what do you think we could do? Concurrently. Concurrently do what? Oh, come on. Memory and. No, we're doing the memory. Concurrently with doing the memory in, in those, in those yeah. cycles. Doing, say it again? It could be like computing the next thing that we want to compute. Well, what is the next thing that we computed? What's the next thing that we needed to compute? Incrementing the program counter. Are you with me? So what can we do? How can we do that? Because see, this took seven cycles. But now we're going to do some concurrency, some hardware parallelism. At the same time we're waiting for that memory, what can we do? We can load the next one that we... Well, no, not, no, we don't, no, we, do, we don't want to fetch the next one because we're fetching this fetching one. This one so but uh, come on, we just said... We, we, can increment the we can increment the program counter. Instead of incrementing the program counter at, at Look, instead of incrementing the program counter here and here, while the memory system is getting its stuff, we can do what? Increment the program counter. Here, let's go back to our original code. Here, here, let's go back. Here, 12.5. Here, let's look at 12.5. Look, the address is being put in the MAR at cycle one. After that's put in cycle one, memory, 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 blah. But what do we have down? How do we increment the program counter? Plus one. Line six and line seven. But line six and line seven, what are those, what, what, what are we using, what hardware are we using? We're using the A bus and the B bus and the C bus and the ALU and the uh, CS MUX and the, you know, blah, blah, blah. But that has no, as far as the memory is, as far as the memory subsystem is concerned, we could stick these where? Where could we stick six and seven? Two and At two and three.
Are you with me? And look, we can combine cycles. Cycle 1 puts a copy of the program counter in the memory address register. During cycles 2 and 3, we can increment the program counter without disturbing the MAR. Do you see how that, why? It's a different part of, you know, it's, it's, the address is in there. Are you with me? All right. Now, as we increment the program counter by 1, is that going to mess up the, what's in the MAR? No. The original value of the program counter is still just going to be in the MAR. Is everybody clear on this? So we can combine this cycle here, cycle 6 with cycle 2. We can combine cycle 7 with cycle 3 and we save two cycles out of the original 7. So look, here it is. Figure 12.7. Do you see what we did here? Cycles 6 is cycle 2, cycle 7 is cycle 3. Yeah? So now there are some, uh, you have a homework, oh by the way I forgot to mention this last time but I was just looking on our schedule. I think we have an exam in here a week from today. Is that correct? Yeah. So you'll have a homework assignment that's due Monday and then we will have the exam on Thursday, a week from today. And there will be a question, one question will be to, to do the, um, one question will be to, I think, do another part of the, maybe fetch the operand specifier or something like that. And you'll use the PEP9. Have you guys downloaded that PEP9 app? It's really slick. Okay, good. Now, there's one more thing that, we'll, that, I, want, that I would like to go over <clears throat> before we quit here. And that is, a, and this is kind of a, a later, this, this feature was not in the textbook, the previous edition, the fourth edition, but this is the latest, greatest, one of the latest, greatest features that we have in PEP9 CPU now. We have, we have these great <coughs> unit tests. And they are built in, and not only that, they're built into the app, so when you um, have a micro program assignment, you need to go to the app, go to the help section, and go to the problem that you're doing and click copy to source button and it will copy those unit pre those unit tests for you. So you don't have to you don't have to I mean you can just do it the click of a button. And here's what it does. Now let's take a look at this at the unit pre and the unit post. So if a, if a program line starts with unit pre colon or unit post colon, then the micro assembler knows that this is a unit test. And let's see if we can read this unit test. Do you see in figure 12.7 it says unit pre IR equals 0x 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So what does that do? What that does is when you run your microprogram, before it runs, it initializes the instruction register to zeros. And then what does it say? PC gets what? 0x00FF. So before your, it will initialize, so you don't have to go in there and manually, we used to have to go in there and manually, you know, put those initial values in to test the microcode. But now it does it all automatically. So PC gets 00FF. And, wh and why do you suppose we put PC equals 00FF there? So there would be a... Because what happens when you add 1 to the program counter? What's going to happen when you add 1 to the program counter and the value is 00FF? What happens if you add 1 to 00FF? What do you get? Come on, you guys. Yeah, so there will be a what? I mean, 00FF zero, zero, is 00000011111111. Zero, 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 one, 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 one. So if you add 1 to this, what will there be? There will be a what? A carry. A carry. Yeah, so this is how we'll test that our shadow carry works. Do you see? And, because, and what did it initialize the shadow carry bit to? 
to zero. So in the end, the shadow carry should be one. I mean, in the end, well, there should be a, a carry, and then if you did it right, then. And now, um, and now, what what else does did this unit pre do? It initialized memory zero x zero zero ff to what? What does it say up there? AB. To AB. Zero x. Yeah, zero, yeah, hexadecimal AB. So that sets up, so, and that's what we're going to fetch. Are you with me? Because the program counter is, z, is uh, at 00 FF, and so at 00 F, there's a 0 X AB. So in the end, where should, where should that AB be? Where should it be? It should be in the instruction register. So the unit post condition says IR equals 0 X AB 0000. zero, zero, zero. And the program counter afterwards should be what? 1 plus 00FF, zero, zero which is what? 0100. Zero, zero, zero. And so if you, when you write your code, what you should do when you write your microprogram, make sure to, um, instead of starting off completely from scratch, go to the help system, click the problem, click copy to source, and those unit tests will be done. And if, you're, if, you're, if it doesn't pass the unit test, a little message will come out and says, oh, didn't pass the unit test and tell you where, why, why it didn't. And then you can go back and step, single step through and do your, do your stuff. I tell you, this is, it used, to be so, it used to be so tedious. Now it's so boom. I mean, you can, it's, it's really, I think it's really nice. I think you're really going to like it. And that's for the next homework? And that's for the next homework, which I think is due on Monday. And then we'll, we'll have, we can uh, answer questions about the homework and, yeah. Are we good? All right. Good deal. See you next time.